Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having me. What a, a privilege uh, to address you in this conversation around energy and energy crisis that we're actually experiencing amid the uh, quite turbulent period of our history. I'd like to uh, bring you a little bit more of, uh, of a reality check on the opportunity for us to really move uh, towards a sustainable future. And the short answer is we're very far. I'm gonna give you, uh, as I am a researcher, I so like look at uh, more of the empirical uh, data and try to make sense of it. And I'm gonna try to share a bit of a story with you on where we're standing with this conversation. Now, are we uh, economically sustainable when we're rethinking about the energy transition? And the previous panel has uh, generously addressed this. Well, the short answer is we are far from being sustainable because the economic imperative and incentives are not there. It is still fundamentally easier to extract oil and export it because the oil is an oligopoly that is now dominating at 90% of distribution around the world. So yes, we can move into renewable, but unless we're changing the economic parameters for distribution to go from concentrated to diffuse, we will not really go into a specific set of opportunity that are building sustainability at large. So as much as appreciating the celebration of how quickly we're taking first steps, Unless we're doing this on a more global level, we are not going to get to any SDGs anytime soon. In fact, the only country that stands a chance to SDG 2030 is Denmark. But how big is Denmark? And so what if we're going to look at conversations such as, will Pakistan be there? Will Nigeria, with their 205 million people projected to become 260 in the next seven years, get there? Will Pakistan or Bangladesh get there? I'm not even mentioning China because I don't want to be controversial for the time being, but even Indonesia or Egypt. So the first reality check I want to bring you over is that unless this country shift, nothing happens. I'd like to remind you that small country making transition, they are from a global perspective inconsequential. Therefore, as much as important to create the opportunity to do that, unless we scale, this will be a conversation that will stay within the conference proceedings, but we're not really going to see much of this. The problem we have is that fundamentally we have only one met method of returns on capital, which is basically how companies are investing largely into CapEx and trying to run OPEX to determine basically what's their revenue. If we're gonna have returns on natural resources, the conversation will change. If we're gonna have returns on human capital, the conversation will change. If we're gonna have metrics on actually how we're gonna have planetary boundaries and so determine growth within the challenges that we can manage, then yes. If we're gonna have more attention on the return on social capital, maybe. But unless we're gonna have a much more ample or expanded version of returns on, if we're gonna keep it on return on financial resources, I can tell you for a matter of fact, research doesn't show we're gonna go anywhere close. And ESG is really a nice distraction if we're not shifting to a degree of concentration, from the degree of diffusion from the current concentration we have. So I'm sorry if I'm bringing bad news to you, but I've been sitting quite anxious to talk to you about the research shows an entirely different direction. Professor Sachs told you before, unless we're fundamentally also changing geopolitics, we're not gonna go any far from here. Why? Because the multipolarity we have in the world is not really changing the energy system. The multipolarity is simply creating much more of a game theory across whether it's US producing oil, whether the oil is coming from Russia or basically being decoupled from the Russian system, whether we're now increasing production in Saudi Arabia. I remind you that last month, uh, Ramco made 39 billion profit just by trading with Russia. And India is acquiring oil from Russia at a really large discount price. So fundamentally, unless we're seeing that the reality that the energy market is not multipolar, we're not gonna really achieve much into this. So it's important to, uh, to the point and the question that are actually underneath uh, our, our uh, panel is the risk of decarbonization reversal. Well, we have a, definitely a problem with decarbonizing, dematerializing if we're not distributing this on a much larger level. So I'd like you to start thinking first of a few important statements. Climate change as a paradigm is a failure. We have been into this conversation for quite long. Have you seen any dramatic shift of paradigm? You see a lot of movement and activism, but we haven't really fundamentally shifted because you cannot reverse a climate which is an entropic system of reference. Can you turn omelets back into eggs? If the answer is no, you should understand climate in the same way. So it's much more about how do we redesign human geography within the adaptation of a system that has fundamentally changed. 
So climate mitigation is probably a better term because it empowers organization and governments to start rethinking infrastructure. Climate adaptability is probably more honorable terms because it's refining that human geography is going to adapt to transformation that unfortunately will not necessarily reverse back. And if you're even worried about the crisis that we have with refugees, bear in mind that for every one degree of temperature rising, we're displacing one billion people around the world. So imagine the Syrian refugees back in the days, it looked like a joke in comparison to what we're really up to. In the United States, we get quite sensitive about the number of people from Central America moving over to the country. These are only a few thousand people. Imagine when hundreds of millions of people are migrating because of the climate. This is something we're really not prepared for. So the amount of resilience we have in on crisis really shows that we are far from the right level of thinking. And this is not because we don't have the solution. I completely uh, subscribe to Professor Sucks. We have the technology and the solution ready for this transformation to happen. We estimate at the World Economic Forum that 80% of the technology solution are ready. So we're no longer in a world in which we are short of ingenuity. It's the opposite. We don't have the economic model to really scale this solution. We don't have the funding going to the right startups. We don't have the ecosystem to reference to really get the startup to scaling. So it's much more about an economic problem that we're facing than a sustainability one from a pure environmental perspective. So we're lacking on the ability to rethink the way we grow. I remind you that if you're still measuring GDP, it was actually introduced by a, a colleague of mine at Harvard called Simon Kustin in 1934. 1934 was a very different world, and the GDP was the most immediate reaction to the Great Depression we had in the United States in 1929. Now, in 1934, the spirit of time was very different, wasn't it? In 2022, we have different problems to solve. But if we're using the same indicator of growth, we're fundamentally using the wrong level of, a sim of actually symmetrical adjustment to understand the challenge we're having. So I'd like you to start thinking more seriously that sometimes the problem is more in the lack of economic differentiation than anything like that. I could talk for more, uh, but I think by the time being, I already um, gave you a perspective of where my thinking goes. Uh, just the last comment on this. Um, when you're looking at desalination, because we need water, is energy intensive. When you're looking at agriculture, is energy intensive. When you're looking at electricity, is energy intensive. When you're looking at household, is energy intensive. Infrastructure, and we expect in 37 more demand on water in the next few years. Do we have that water? We don't have it. Therefore, we'll need to resort more on oil and gas unless we're really transitioning on a much more global scale about this. This is food for thought. This is what research currently shows. Uh, Sometimes it's um, difficult to be uh, optimistic when you're looking at the direction of travel. It's not necessarily going in the direction of the lip service. But I'm here just basically to engage with you and look forward to the opportunity to engage deeper in the conversation. Thank you very much.